between Sepulveda and Sawtell. I think you are absolutely right. And if you call over the New Art, they can give you the dates. Uh, not to be missed. Absolutely not to be missed. Um, that takes care of that. Uh, by the way, very nice article that, uh, that uh, Sam Frank wrote. Um, there's, uh, uh, that's the phone is ringing. It's probably Sam Frank. No, I don't want to talk to Sam Frank. Um, wanted to uh, remind you again to get your letters off to, uh, to the Southland Corporation, to the 7-Eleven food stores, to let them know that you're not happy about censorship and that uh, even though uh, Mr. Meese thinks that appointing uh, uh, Rehnquist as the, uh, the head of the Supreme Court is a good thing, that we, we are on to them all. Uh, I'll give you an address again. Uh, if you want to send it locally, it is uh, the Southland Corporation, the 7-Eleven stores. This is the Western Pacific Division. And they are at 1240 South State College Boulevard, Suite 100, P.O. Box 6520, that's 6520, in Anaheim, 92806. Um, or you can address it to the president of the 7-Eleven food stores, the corporate offices, at Post Office Box 719, Dallas, Texas, 75221. I'll try and give you that later. If someone will remind me, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I, I repeat this information because a great many people contacted us and said, that could they have those addresses so they could, uh, so they could let the 7-Eleven stores know how unhappy they were uh, about the, um, uh, the censoring, uh, the dropping of uh, Playboy and uh, Playgirl and uh, Penthouse from, uh, from the 7-Eleven stores. Lost Horizon is at the... Uh, it's at the New Art, and it's two hours and 11 minutes, and it runs from June 29th to July 5th at the New Art, and there will be matinees on June 29th, July 4th, and July 5th. And that takes care of that. Um, okay, now, this is a good one. You're going to like this. We've been getting these, these letters, see, and, uh, 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 boy, some of you send the silliest damn letters. And a lot of you draw on the envelopes, which is really silly. I mean, that stuff went out with, you know, when you were in high school. But there's one yup yup who keeps sending me letters that are in old Southern California Edison Company payment envelopes. And they're scrawled and they're scribbled and the typing is bad and, uh, and it can't even spell Kawanga. He spells it Kawanga. And uh, uh, I just, you know, uh, the letters are falling apart. They, they, yeah, so I deep six them. I don't even open them. I don't, I don't even read them. Well, this last week when we picked up the mail here at the st station, here was another one of these things. And I said, okay, toss it in the garbage can. Don't even read it. But as they were about to, somebody said, wait a minute, here's a name and address on it, who it's from. And we looked, and the name and address were Steve Barnes, my friend, your friend, writer Steve Barnes, uh, who wrote Street Lethal and, uh, and who did the uh, 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 teacher's aid that was on uh, Twilight Zone last week. And it had his address on it. I recognized the address. So I said, oh, that's who's sending it. It's silly dip. Why is he doing that? Well, I opened it, and of course, it was not from Steve Barnes. And it was another letter full of imbecile silliness. And so I called Steve, and I said, Steve... Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -da. You know, what is this? Uh, what, what's going on here? And he said, I know who that's from. And I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, there's this idiot named Lee Smith. Now, apparently this Lee Smith is some sort of dippy fan who uh, has gotten himself in a lot of trouble and uh, is on the lam in L.A. and can't hang out around Las Vegas or anything else, but apparently lives out of his car in Long Beach. And when Steve told me he lives out of his car in Long Beach, I took a look, and the postmark on this is, of course, Long Beach. There's, of course, only four cents post uh, five cents postage on it. There's five one-cent stamps on it. You know, it got through, uh, but, uh, but uh, it's postmarked Long Beach. So this is Lee Smith. Now, up till now, all Lee Smith has done is write idiot letters, which we're able to throw away, and that's dope. We're not, but when Lee Smith put Steve Barnes' name on it, ooh, this is called using the mail to piss us off. So, we would appreciate it if someone would get in touch with us, or a group, a group of someone's, and let us know where Lee Smith is, because Steve Barnes, who is, I guess Steve is now a black belt, uh, I don't know what his rigor is. I, it's Tai Chi Chuan, or uh, you know. Uh, and I, of course, uh, 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 did did a little of the of, of that activity for a while. Uh, we want to go find Lee Smith, and if he won't come out of his car, we can always uh, we can always hurrah the car. 
Do you know how easily it is you can pull a fender off a car? It really is easy. And I got a rip saw at home. I got a wonderful rip saw. It's got the teeth that bend in both directions, so you rip on the pull and on the pull back. We can flatten his tires real quick. We'd appreciate it if someone would let us know where Lee Smith is. Uh, because Steve Barnes and I are looking for him and want you to know that, you know, you people can have as much fun as you want with us, but we're going to have fun back with you. I have to clear up uh, a misunderstanding. Well, it's not actually a misunderstanding. I have to uh, give you a small addenda. Some weeks ago, when Mick Garris was on and we were talking about, uh, he was talking about amazing stories and some of the things that had gone wrong, and I was talking about Twilight Zone and some of the things that had gone wrong, we were talking about Rock O'Bannon's script shadow man which oddly enough was reprised tonight on twilight zone at uh, at at eight o'clock and uh, i talked about uh, what i consider to be a, a bad uh, 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 a, a bad call on the on the last shot where you have a kid hanging by his by his neck in the grip of, of this, this creature, this shadow creature. And the camera holds on, and the camera pulls back and back and back and up and up and up and really bad. And I thought they should cut the shot or put some narration over it or something. And I blamed Rock for that because, and, and because his, my recollection was that Rock wanted it that way, that he, he didn't want any narration, he just wanted that shot. And I thought, God, that was one case where we shouldn't really have, have gone with Rock's judgment. But I had forgotten something. I had forgotten something, and it's something very important. It was not, in fact, Rock's fault. Rockney was prepared to have the shot either trimmed or narration or something. Joe Dante, the director, threatened to take his name off the segment unless they left the show alone. He was upset that it had been edited already because there was a lot of other stuff in it that was of questionable taste in terms of the network. I mean, the network thought so. I didn't particularly think so, but the network. And he was annoyed about that, and so he, uh, uh, he threatened to take his name off if they did anything at the end, and so it went the way it went. So don't blame Rock. I have to get him off the hook on that one. I promised Rock I would clear that up. Okay, I'm throwing away that little piece of paper. That takes care of that. Okay, we got the Lee Smith crap taken care of. There's your letter, Lee. That goes right into the bucket. Um, we're going to do the calendar. We got Dick Lockie sitting out there in the other room. Uh, I, I want to tell you a couple of the upcoming things. Uh, we're going to be talking to Sheila Finch one of these nights very soon about her writer's workshop. Um, Julius Schwartz, Julius Schwartz, the legendary editor of DC Comics, Julius Schwartz will be coming to town early in August, and he wants to come on this show. And I've known Julie. 40 years, and uh, 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 we're going to talk about the early days of comics. We're going to talk about him when he was an agent. He was the agent for Edmund Hamilton. He was the agent for, uh, for all of for Fred Pohl, for all of the big, all of the big uh, writers in the, in, in, in the 30s and 40s. And uh, we're going to talk about many, many other wonderful things he'll be coming on. I'm also going to read to you and talk to you about John Fante. Black Sparrow Press is in the middle of a revival of John Fante's books. He is one of the marvelous Los Angeles writers. Uh, some of his books uh, uh, are, are, are just beyond, beyond belief. They're that wonderful. And he's very little known. And I'm going to try and uh, con you into loving John Fante and getting in touch with Black Sparrow Press to, to get some books from them. Uh, that'll be coming up in the next few weeks. I think we're going to let Terry do the calendar right now. Ter oh my goodness, Terry's wearing an off-the-shoulder evening gown. I don't know where she was this evening, but she'll no doubt tell us. And there's a fresh gardenia in her hair. Bert, would you make sure that Terry tells us where she was tonight as we go to the Starscape? By the way, did I, uh, did I say thank you for the $8,800 that uh, we raised last week? Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, group mind, you you was you was swell. I took that eighty eight hundred dollars and I went to uh, I went to uh, the Cote d'Azur uh, all last week. It was wonderful. Uh, the station, of course, uh, was closed. Uh, they they foreclosed on the uh, on the station. Oh, well, you can't have everything. Uh, I've decided what I'm going to do with the Clark Ashton Smith story, the reading of the City of the Singing Flame, rather than have Dick Lochte, uh, whose time is valuable sit here and listen to me read this damn thing to you. I'm going to take the last 20, 25 minutes of the show and read it then. So you can turn out the lights and you'll fall asleep and I'll be reading it and then it'll segue right into whatever good music comes on after us. Um, I'm going to save the column that I was going to read you, The Law is a Ass by Robert Ingersoll, which is all about uh, Marvel's X-Factor comic. I'm going to save that till next time. I want to tell you again about Joe the Taylor. 
I got to tell you about Joe the Tech. You, you see, you people don't know the weird stuff that I get in the mail here and the questions that I get. We had somebody ask us, a couple of people ask us, about lobby cards, movie lobby cards. How could they preserve them? So I go checking around, and I find, you know, if you want something in this life, Dick, it's out there. All you got to mm-hmm. do is find it. And I sh- sure as God made little green apples, I found an ad in uh, Movie Collector's World for a guy called Joe the Taylor in Bellingham, Washington. Now, folks, get your pad and pencil because you've been asking me about this, and we got cut off last time, and I didn't get to give you a chance to give you the full address. But I'm going to tell you about it. He makes these vinyl, what they call hang-ups, and you can hang them on the wall, and they are made specifically to hold lobby cards from movies which are collector's pieces, and he makes them very inexpensively, and they're beautiful. He sent me one. I mean, I have no lobby cards, but he sent me one to look at because I told him I'm going to mention you on the air. Now, Joe the tailor is this man who just, he's a tailor, and he, and he does these things with, 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 with uh, uh, these are see-through multi-purpose wall hangings with three very roomy pockets, clear 8 mil vinyl, doubled and stitched with white vinyl binding, two brass eyelets for easy hanging. And there's another, he makes another one you put love letters in. Sounds great. Do you, do you have love letters? Uh, quite a few, probably too many for to fit into that one little thing. There. That you've gotten or that you wrote and S- got back? Some that I've written, some that I've gotten back from people, some that have been made up totally out of whole cloth. I knew early on in life that of all the things I could write that would get me in trouble, love letters were the ones I have never ever written a love You have letter. to type them, and you don't sign it with your <laughs> Right, you say, and you send it through a post office box. <laughs> Anyhow, Joe the Taylor, for those of you who are interested in having uh, these things, and we got flyers here. We got flyers. If, uh, if you want one, uh, leave your name and address with Bert, and uh, we'll get a flyer to you because uh, Joe the Taylor is out there. It's post office box 2296-C, Bellingham, Washington, 98227. Post Office Box 2296-C, Bellingham, Washington, 98227. That's Joe the Taylor. And um, if you want one of his flyers, just uh, give us a call. Uh, you, you, you know our, uh, our call letters, the world-famous 818-985-KPFK. And we'll be taking some calls after a little while. You can talk to Dick Lockley. Um, I got that. I got Joe the Taylor. Oh, one other thing. Terry... Uh, somebody uh, w- during the drive wanted a copy of Again Dangerous Visions and I got one here that I'm going to give to them but we don't know who to autograph it to because we don't have their name so you, can I leave this with you and you'll get, take charge and you tell me what the name is we'll eventually sign it okay that gets all the stuff out of the way now now we get to the man sitting across from me I'd, I'd like to hear a little more about Joe the Taylor though before, well, before we get to this I know this is fascinating I know this Joe the Taylor stuff is real fascinating okay but um, all right we'll just forget about Joe for a minute can we can we pass on Joe absolutely I mean I know this is going to upset you but all right we'll we'll, we'll get past Joe uh, Dick Lochte, uh as it says here on the inside back flap will you sign this by the way before you go sure you? Absolutely. absolutely it's wonderful Dick Lock it says in the back flap of the book Dick Lochte is a theater critic we all know he's the theater critic for Los Angeles, uh, for uh, California magazine. Los Angeles magazine. Los Angeles, right? And yeah. you do the. What, no, wait a minute, wait, wait. What is. I'm getting it all confused again. Okay, uh-huh. it's Los Angeles magazine that you do the theater reviews for, mm-hmm. right? And the book reviews you do. For the Los Angeles Times primarily, but I'm, I'm working a little bit for the Herald Examiner and for whoever else will have me. I have a book review in California next month. So it, it gets complicated. But you, you've had them in the past, too, haven't you? Uh, no, this is the first time I've uh, ever Why the hell did I, did I associate you with California? Well, it doesn't matter. This is, this is wool gather. He has also done, uh, for 10 years, for 10 years. 10 years I did a column for the Book m- notes. Are you still doing book notes? No. Oh, you stopped doing stopped book notes. Stopped doing it. That was the only place I got any publicity, for Christ's sake. Well, I mean, uh, maybe the, maybe the new people will do it. I think they've been giving you publicity all along, and you, you didn't know about mm. it. Did you hear that Digby is going to be leaving the Herald Examiner? That's what I heard. Yeah, we were sitting next to each other at a screening the other night, and he's uh, he's on trial at CBS, but uh, they like him, he likes them, and mm-hmm. uh, the Herald Examiner got their nose out of joint, and they said, you can't do this in another medium. It's interesting. Y- you, you would think that they would want to have somebody who is well-known. Yeah. Yeah, it would so only help up, up their circulation. I mean, he's not going to write any less with any less quality. I doubt it, no. It's it's silly. They're they're really silly. He's wearing uh, bow ties now. I saw Have him. you noticed that? Well, that's the TV image, I think. He's got the bow ties. Yeah. 
This it's, is Digby Deal like we're talking about. Uh, Digby, you know, Digby's going to be the uh, the MC at this roast they're doing of me in July. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, I I look forward to it because years ago they did a roast of Digby, and I was on the platform with Daryl Ponixon and. Uh, 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 Ray Bradbury and uh, Joe Wamba and boy we just did a good job on him mm -hmm. anyhow I want to talk to you about uh, Sleeping Dog mm -hmm. this is the mis this is Dick Lochte's first book that's right and it is a first novel but it is more than just a first novel I mean apart from it being a wonderful mystery it is a Los Angeles book boy is it a Los Angeles book it is so on the money and Dick, I, I mean, I don't want to give too much of the plot away. Mm -hmm. That's that's a bad thing. You gotta. Get, but uh, how do I explain it? It's 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 about this this blase private eye named Bloodworth and this teenage girl who goes around on roller skates whose name is Serendipity, mm -hmm. and her dog Groucho has been stolen. All of this sounds so mad, and her grandmother is on a soap opera. Oh yeah, and her mother is well. A, spa a bimbo. Right, exactly. The mother is definitely a bimbo. And uh, uh, it has all of the wonders of Woolrich and, and Chandler and all the usual wow. gods who are invoked, but as if they were done by the Marx Brothers. I mean, it stood on its head. <laughs> well, that's nice. Uh, I, that's sort of, I guess, I, I don't know that I was want I wanted to do exactly that, but, but that's, uh, I wanted to put a little humor into the whole thing, but also... I love those things. I love I love Walrus. I love Chandler. I love the, the the old stories. You know. But you didn't steal. You refurbished them. You did them. Mm. You did them as if they were. It's it's homage, but it's but it's but it's your own voice. It's I, I mean I must I must tell you I'm I'm enormously impressed. It is a very distinguished first novel. Well, thank you, thank you. I want to I want to uh, I want to give them I want to give the audience. I gotta get you gotta listen to this, folks. This is this is the first three paragraphs of sleeping dog now listen to this this is this is a section that is told by well what the, what the book ostensibly is it's a melding of these two novels well how the, how the hell do i explain it you go you tell them what how, the, the, oh, the yeah, device you right. use. <laughs> well the point is that that supposedly two people turned in novels dealing w with the same personal experience that they've had and the publishers uh, the one of the publishers bought out the other one, and so both books wound up on the same schedule of the same publishing house, and the house decided to combine both books to give you sort of a Rashomon effect of, of what happened in, in this particular episode. And one of the people was a private eye, and the other is a, a teenage girl. And 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 you were the you were the ghostwriter who was, I was hired. The, I was the guy who was hired to put the two books together and, and make some sense from it. And there's a, there's a, there's an author's preface that talks about this, and it and it talks about this uh, this series of brutal murders committed in California during the summer of 1982, which of course are fictitious, but mm -hmm. but for but purposes of this book they are real. And there's a paragraph here in which Dick Lochte, as 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 Greek chorus is saying about these two books that came in <coughs> at the same time in the same publishing house. Obviously, they could not be released individually. The decision was made to use them both, combining them into one volume with excessive repetition deleted. The authors were not pleased by this decision. They viewed the result as, quote, excessive and repressive editorial meddling from Ms. Dahlquist, she's the teenage girl, mm -hmm. and, quote, a first-class axe job. That was Bloodworth. He's mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, Leo G. Bloodworth is the private eye. Mm -hmm. and, and it begins with a section from from serendipity uh, uh serendipity ren dahlquist's uh book uh, dog days a personal account of the casper helmdale slayings and um this is the first three paragraphs and this doesn't make you want to dash out instantly to any store in the southern california area uh, where it is available and it is available everywhere listen to this this is chapter one teenage girl speaking my last day as a hopeless junior high school worm was marked with Mared, veritably mottled with Mared. Someone stole my slam book. 
Even now, nearly a year and a half later, I remain unconvinced that I simply misplaced it. Then, Sylvia Leon Leonidas, my supposedly best friend, with whom and with whose parents I had planned on motoring through the great Northwest, dropped the bomb that she had managed to get herself with child, thanks to some George person. Not a Bay Heights boy, more is the pity, for I have it on good authority that their narcotic consumption has rendered them 99-44-100% impotent. In any case, it's difficult to imagine a woman in her mid-teens, even one as admittedly backward as Sylvia, failing to take steps to avoid the possibility of conception. And George was almost college age, for heaven's sake. Because of their sexual ignorance and lack of self-control, the trip through the great Northwest was off. Piling grief upon grief, Mr. Macklin, whom I cannot abide as either a teacher or a representative of the human race, gave me a C-plus in functions and limits and would not budge on it, though I humbled myself before his table in the faculty lounge, begging for a B-minus, and then... Would it never end? Greg Stillman, a Pacifica High senior with serious blue eyes, who'd asked me to a junior-senior thing at Carbon Beach, got so stoned after his physics final that he fell into the Pacifica swimming pool while it was drained and broke his leg in two places. Accepting the fact that this was destined to be my deus iria, I skated home as quickly and carefully as possible to discover that the door to the apartment had been left open and that my beloved little bull terrier, Groucho, was missing. Now, this may seem to you the ditziest opening for a mystery novel in the history of the universe, up to and including the Mr. and Mrs. North novels, but the, the absence of the Groucho, mm. the absence of the dog Groucho, leads serendipity and Leo G. Bloodworth into depths of depravity unparalleled in the history of Western civilization. That's true. That's true. Do you want to talk more about the plot? Well, uh... Yeah, we could talk a little bit about it, I suppose. That that uh, I didn't want it just to be. Uh, I wanted it to be a serious adventure that they were having, so that it it wasn't just going to be fun and games. So I I do get them involved in some pretty pretty rough stuff, including dog fights, which is about the most loathsome loath loathsome thing that you can uh, get involved with these days along some of these coasts. Uh, I didn't want it to be preaching, and yet I don't know how you can deal with dogfights without coming down a little bit on them. And when you do it without preaching, you do it by showing it. Mm -hmm. The examples are, are grotesque and horrible. And all of those are pretty pretty factual. There's there's a uh, I was I was pointing out to uh, to uh, to Dick uh, earlier there was a, no a novel that came out some years ago by Stephen Geller. Uh, the uh, the uh, the man who wrote she let him continue that was made into the movie Pretty Poison, and the book uh, was uh, was done in '67. Hardly anybody knows it. I don't think it's ever been reprinted because it is a mean book, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole the whole pit bull thing is so vile and detestable. And the people who do raise these pit bulls, they talk about it as if it were a holy. Uh, oh, very much so. It's either either they either consider themselves as sportsmen or. Uh some sort of strange Freedom animal. fighters. Well, you know. yeah. Yeah, they, they, they talk about themselves like the Contras. It's, exactly. It's very strange. Uh, the book ranges all over uh, uh, Southern California, and, and the, uh, uh, the little things you slip in, the, the little sights and scenes are so wonderful. And, and you go back and, you know, you read Chandler, and you say, God, I, or you, John Fonte is the same. You say, God, I wish that, like Angel's Flight, mm. uh, or... or, or uh, or the Brown Derby, or, or, or the Tale of the Pup, you know, things like that. You yeah. wish that the things that they talk about were still there so you could see them, and now all we have are big filing cabinets for people. It's unfortunate, but that's true, yeah. But really eating this town up? You, you, how long, you, you, are you a native? No, no, I'm from New Orleans. I, I, I've been here for about 12 years, I guess, 13 years. Uh, came here by way of Chicago. Will you ever leave L.A.? I don't know. It's very tough. Uh... It does get into your blood, and and uh, don't, don't it just? It really does. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I go back east, and people talk to me about it. And they say, "How can you live out there?" And I look at them, and I laugh. How can I live out there? I said, "There mm -hmm. hasn't been a day since 1962 when I got here that I have not felt like Ali Baba in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. I just adore this town." You know, they always say that whenever they do a parody of Chandler or something, it's always the end of the the, the caper is. The, the detective going out and saying, I love this filthy, corrupt city. <laughs> but, I, but that's the way I feel. <laughs> I just love this filthy, corrupt city. <laughs> my, my image is that L.A. is like a big baby with a shotgun in its mouth. Very good. It'll do, it'll do anything. Uh -huh. It's what New York was in, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the mid-50s and, uh, and ain't no more and hasn't been for 20 years. No. Well, I, w what, 
what suddenly brought you to your how old now? Oh, I'm in early 40s. Early, early 40s. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can safely say okay, that. Okay, early 40s, I'm safe. What what brought you to the novel at this point? I mean, was it always in you? Did you always hunger to do it? Well, you mentioned Digby Deal before, so th there's a story that goes with this book. About uh, 10 years ago, when I first started doing book reviews, uh, Digby li used to like, he was the then the editor of the, of the um, uh, Los Angeles Times book review section, mm -hmm. and he loved to have little blurbs about you at the end of the book review. And he didn't like you to say that you were working on a screenplay because everybody who was doing book reviews was working on a screenplay. So he said, I mean, don't you, aren't you working on a novel? And I said, no. And I said, but if I did, I'd probably do a mystery novel. So he said, well, why don't we put in here that you're working on a mystery novel? Would you do, just do three pages or a chapter or something so that it'll, be? so I did. I, I knocked out a chapter of a book or something and they put it in there. And every time they would run a book review of mine, they would always say he's working on a mystery <laughs> novel. <laughs> for 12 so, years. So about, about three or four years of, after this, people started calling. Like, I, I got a call from this guy, Ash Green, who was with Knopf and who was uh, Ross McDonald's agent, uh, well, Ross McDonald's editor, and he called and, and said, I'd like to take a look at this book. So I was thinking that maybe I ought to start writing this book, you know. <laughs> since the world already thought it since existed. Since everyone thought it existed. And I, I worked on a book then that uh, just didn't work out, and I got tired of it and put it aside. Then about a year and a half ago or two years ago, I was having lunch with Nick Meyer, the guy who wrote The 7% Solution and has gone on to become a film director. And he kept pushing me to write a book of something. He said, why don't you write a book? And so I thought maybe I should. And I went home and um, came up with the idea. And that's why the book is partially dedicated to Nick because he was the guy that pushed it. Do you, do you remember where we met? Do you know how we met? Do you remember where we met? Uh, I don't remember where, no. Because I, I didn't either until I was reminded by Linda Strawn. Oh, Linda. Linda had a party yeah. years ago, and I had no idea the heavyweights that were at that party. Nick Meyer was also Yeah, that's where party. I met him that's at that same party. That's where you met party. Nick, and yeah. that's where I met you. Uh -huh. and, and we've known each other ever since then, and it was some hell of a party. That's true. There yeah. were a lot of people there. Uh, I mean, uh, writers that I'd only, you know, heard about suddenly showed up there. Yeah, it was uh, it was just one of those moments in time where everybody came to the same place. It was terrific. Uh -huh. That was the place where I where I uh, I threatened to uh, to kill David Geiler if he ever came into my presence again. <laughs> really? And he turned around and ran the other way, and he hasn't stayed out of my sight ever since. So it worked. Oh, it did indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a, not a man I like very much. Um, the book review thing, I. I find, uh, as the years go by, it gets harder and harder for me to do book reviews because I know more and more of the writers. Yeah. And if you are, you know, one of these people who who really feels that you must judge the material, whatever the friendship may be, uh, you get yourself in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill Pronzini is pissed at me and has been. Oh, for, yeah? Oh, God, yes. Uh, and I didn't even review it. I just didn't feel like giving a quote on a certain book and I love most everything else of Bill's it happened to that one I didn't like and I couldn't in conscience do it and he hasn't spoken to me since has that happened to you? Yeah it uh, it, it does happen uh, the thing that, that once you write the book and you know what pe what you go through and, and I know what I feel when I see the book reviews that come in from the publisher like they send them to you in big thick packets and you start reading through it and it's painful when you read these these, these book reviews yeah. that, that that uh, even if they're wrong, <laughs> and you know they're wrong, but still it was in print somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you can't argue. You can't argue with it. I no. mean, if you do, it winds up as a stupid letter in exactly, the uh, letters yeah. of the editor, and everybody likes uh, you know spoil sport. So uh, yeah, I, I find now it's very difficult to do reviews. Uh, I'm always tougher on mysteries. I always have been than if I didn't love them so much. Yeah. And lately, I will get sent a book, especially a first book. There are a lot of sports writers who are writing mysteries now. Yeah. I don't know why, but they really can't write mysteries worth a hoot. And it's tough to... <laughs> to be kind. To be kind, yeah. or just not to be as mean as you want to be. What did you think of Ray Bradbury's mystery? Uh, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was much of a mystery, but I, I loved the evocation of, of the era, and I, I liked a lot about it. 
the, Ray, uh, Ray has been wanting to write a mystery fairy. In fact, most people don't realize that that's the first real novel he's ever written. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Martian Chronicles is a series of right. short stories and uh, 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 well, uh, maybe, Something Wicked maybe, maybe. Something Wicked was was linked, sto- was originally story. Well, uh, Dandelion, Dandelion Line. Dandelion Line might be. Yeah, so maybe Something Wicked, I guess, was his first yeah. real novel. Because uh-huh. Fahrenheit 451 is only a novella. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but it's it's fascinating to see. I uh, for years, I mean, I, I I wrote so many mysteries when I started writing. I mean, mm-hmm. that's what I wrote. Yeah. Uh, that I never got around to writing a mystery novel. But Otto Penzler at Mysterious Press has been nudging and nudging. Uh-huh. And he's good. He's oh, he's good. Oh, he's sharp. He really he's 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 built that lineup from nothing in uh-huh. two years. So I've been working on a mystery myself now for about three years. Good. It's called Penny Dreadful. Uh-huh. And, good time. Uh huh. Good uh, when when it comes out, I'll let you attack it. <laughs> okay, I have to tell you that that uh, Bradbury was was extremely kind to me because my book came out pretty much around the time it debuted, around the time that his did, and we always kept winding up together at signings or, and a kinder guy I've never seen. I mean, he mm. got people to buy my book. Yeah, you know, he was, it was Razor Mensch. He no really question about it. Razor Mensch. Fellow. He's Fine always fellow. been a Mensch. Well, let's see. It was something else I wanted to ask you. What the hell was it? It was about, oh, the theater. How many nights a week do you spend at the theater, for God's sake? These days, very few. I may have to spend uh, a day and a night there for the for the um, Nicholas Nickleby, but I go to four plays a month. I should go to more. I try to get up to eight but and settle for six, but usually it's four. <laughs> you know, in all the years that I've been here, I have found that every time I go to... Uh, one of the big theaters for one of the big things. I'm mm-hmm. always disappointed. Invariably, I'm disappointed. It's like, you know, a road show. The first thing I ever saw in this town, I was dragged. I God, I remember as if it were yesterday. I couldn't have been here more than two or three months, and a woman I was dating dragged me downtown to the Masonic, or where was it they used to have the plays downtown? The big, great big theater. Well, they were, it was Camelot with oh. Louis Hayward. <laughs> Remember Louis Hayward? Sure, he played was the saint. <laughs> sh- right. Louis Hayward was shorter than I am. I mean, man, you know, I'm 5'5". Five, five. Louis Hayward was a munchkin, for Christ's sake. And here he was playing King Arthur. And he doesn't. He didn't have too loud a voice, no, either, as I recall. No. He was a very he, soft-spoken he, man. A sweet man, a nice mm-hmm. man, but uh, uh, <laughs> not really one of the great thespes of our time. And I sat there, having just come from New York... And I thought to myself, I've died and gone to hell. <laughs> and I'm going to be forced for the rest of my life to see drama on the stage in Los Angeles. But when I go to little theaters, I go to the little the little uh, storefront theaters, uh-huh. the ones in the valley, invariably I see things that are marvelous, just amazing. Now, why in the hell should that be? Well, I have a theory about this. Please tell me. It, it's not only, it's not just the, the, the stuff that the, the, that the play is made of, but it's the acting is better. The actors out here are television and film actors which means that they do small gestures they're not playing to back rows they're they're playing to a camera so that when you go to a small theater it's the ideal thing you're sitting right on top of them you're seeing them from the camera's eye and you don't they're not blasting past your past your past your head when you go downtown to the to the civic you know to the Chandler Pavilion and all of those these people are you know they're they're shouting to those back rows and they kill whatever life is in a lot of plays. Yeah. Uh, also, they, they do a lot of good revivals in the small houses, which uh, they, they're plays that they wouldn't take chances uh, on down at the, at the bigger ones. I saw Cats in town here, mm-hmm. and uh, I had seen it in New York, yeah. and I loved it in New York. It was marvelous. It was very energetic and wonderful, but I didn't know what all the shouting was about. I mean, I said, well, that's kind of nice, but it's, you know, why is everybody going crazy? Then I saw it here, and I thought, oh, my God, it's a disaster. It was just horrible here. Mm-hmm. Then I saw it in London. Ah. The London perf- the London version is the original version yeah. with the circular stage. And the, you know, New York has the, the most virile and vigorous dancers. Mm-hmm. But they, but the English music, people are uh they're not as they're not as as you know that bob fossey throwing the bodies around yeah. but god have they got style it was breathtaking i was mm-hmm. i just sat there stunned the the england's got some interesting shows that are coming to this country now one of them is is uh 
uh, a musical version of Les Miserables, which the album is dynamite. It, it really is good. I heard the good. album, yeah, the uh, album is wonderful. Now, and they're also doing the Phantom of the Opera. The, uh, Weber's has done Phantom of the Opera, and there's a video that appeared on television this week of the, one of the songs from Phantom of the Opera. And I'm sitting here watching this thing, and the song isn't very good to begin with. It's, you know, it, it's very re repetitive... He's the phantom of the opera. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Top Gun. Yeah, I'm right. going up. I'm going. Right. But the video gives you the complete story in about eight minutes. So I just don't know what you want to see. You know, what are they going to do with the other hour? And you probably fill it up with with uh, you know him swinging on the chandelier and singing about. Uh, I guess, but I mean, we see him cut the chandelier. We see the chandelier fall. We see the the, the girl's boyfriend get out of the way. I, you know, it's just. Nonsense, nonsense. I, I was I was writing my column. I write this film column, uh, and I was writing it today, and I was finishing it up, and and it occurred to me, it came to me with a shock, that it is virtually impossible these days to discuss or review or even critique a film on the accepted bases that have always obtained. You can't judge a film these days. I haven't touched this water. No, I'm, 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 I was just doing it nervously. Well, here's anyhow. Here's water. If you Thanks. Want, I got the coffee. Um, that you can't talk about it in terms of screenplay or direction or, or, or acting or, or even set design anymore because none of that matters. What matters is will they be able to produce a music video mm -hmm. and loop it together with, with you know, s six minutes of, 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 of action shots from the film to get a gold album. Right. And, and this is, uh, they've turned this art form into, well, I mean, I mean they've, they've merchandised it as far as it can go. It's been cut to its basic. And we see films like Top Gun is a classic example. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just there's nothing there, absolutely nothing there. The thing that really annoys me, I, I, I must say I haven't seen Top Gun, but what annoys me about the concept of Top Gun is I don't even mind them making a war movie. You know, that doesn't bother me. It does bother me that you don't know who the enemy is. Yeah. I mean, how can you make a movie without telling some... Even Star Wars tells you who the enemy is vaguely, you know, in the first one. I don't know why they can't uh, they think they can get by with stuff like this, and they they obviously are getting well, by. Don't with you know who the enemy is? <laughs> well, it's a teenage movie. I mean, that's all. Yeah. It is. It's a teenage yeah. movie. In this case, it's a teenage the, movie with with airplanes. What the enemy of the adults? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The enemy is a third. There are three things, three things that you, if if you got a, a real teenage movie like Porky's, mm -hmm. you get all three, and the three things you get are bare tits, mm -hmm. destruction of personal and public property, and flaunting of authority. Yeah. And uh, uh, you get that in all of these films, whether it's a cop movie, or it's a western like Silverado, or Short Circuit, mm -hmm. which is nothing but a, a, I mean, if you see number five, the robot, as a James Dean rebel, you know, coming, not being able to come to terms with what it is adults do, like killing each other. Yeah. Uh, and they turn all the adult figures into, into cartoons who are inept and evil, randomly evil, also stupid beyond belief. Uh, then, you, then you see all of these films as, as the enemy is anybody who isn't listening to music at 180 decibels. Hmm, yeah. And so that's, I guess, who the enemy is in Top Gun, you know, authority. I don't know. I saw this film, um, I think, uh, what does it go? Ruthless People, I guess. Yeah. Did you happen to I, catch I missed it. We were going to see it the other night. I, 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 I must say that I, I laughed quite a bit during the course of it. And, but I noticed that there's not one scene that runs longer than a minute and a half. I mean, they just seem to be 500 yeah. scenes in this film. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's this MTV concept That's where it. you have to keep changing, changing, changing. It's a horrible, it's a horrible uh, necessity. Speaking of horrible necessities... You see, I had to use that phrase so that I could give the call letters, because this is KPFK in Los Angeles, 90.7 on your FM dial, Pacifica Foundation to all of Southern California. All, all of Southern? All of all. Southern California. We get, listen, do you want to know how far north they hear this? How far north? Ultima Thule. Really? <laughs> we got a postcard <laughs> from Ultima Thule. No, that's a lie. That's out in the ocean somewhere. Actually, we got listeners up in San Francisco. Got listeners in Sacramento. Great. Oh, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they are out there. As a matter of fact, in very short order... Uh, we're going to take some phone calls. We're going to let people talk to uh, Richard Lochte, Dick Lochte, that's who I'm talking to, the uh, former book reviewer for uh, The Universe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, book notes for the, uh, for the L.A. Times, and, uh, and theater critic for the, uh, for, uh, uh, I'm doing it again, Los Angeles Magazine. Right. Jesus, Jeff Miller is going to kill me. He will. He, he will, will, too. He, he, he does get mad at things like yeah. that. Yeah, Jeff is, Jeff is like that. I, 
I was waiting for you to come in because I wanted to show you this. I was talking about Borges. This is a uh, photo. You, f- you people out there cannot see it. This is wonderful. a photo that I have up on my office wall, and I've had it there for about three years. This is a photo that was taken of Borges when he went to Baltimore. He was 83 at the time, blind, and perennially the candidate for the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he is, and he is sitting there, and the photographer has taken a picture of him running his fingers over a bas-relief plaque honoring Edgar Allan Poe. I know, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's an astonishing photo that this, this, this transcendental writer is paying homage to his God. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, this is an, a, a rare photo because this is two of my three writing gods, the third one being Kafka, uh, who was probably present in, uh, in spirit in that picture. Oh, I thought maybe that was... Him in the background. <laughs> There's someone in the background. I don't know who it is. It's someone standing there and waiting for him to. And here is his 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 poor blind face staring up and mm-hmm. touching the Poe. It's 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 really lovely. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful photo. I wanted to uh, before we open the lines. I just wanted to read. This is this is the poem that Borges uh, wrote that was published in uh, the New Yorker on the second of June. And it's amazing that this is the poem that he would the last poem that he would have had published. It's called the Web. Which of my cities am I doomed to die in? Geneva, where revelation reached me from Virgil and Tacitus, certainly not from Calvin. Montevideo, where Louis Melian Lafaneur, blind and heavy with years, died among the archives of that impartial history of Uruguay he never wrote. Nara, where in a Japanese inn I slept on the floor and dreamed the terrible image of the Buddha I had touched without seeing but saw in my dream. Buenos Aires, where I verge on being a foreigner. Austin, Texas, where my mother and I in the autumn of 61 discovered America? What language am I doomed to die in? The Spanish my ancestors used to call for the charge or to play truco? The English of the Bible my grandmother read from at the edges of the desert? What time will it happen? In the dove-colored twilight when color drains away, or in the twilight of the crow when night abstracts and simplifies all visible things? Or at an inconsequential moment, two in the afternoon? These questions are digressions that stem not from fear, but from impatient hope. They form part of the fateful web of cause and effect that no man can foresee, nor any god. Isn't that amazing? Wonderful. Yeah. His like will surely never come again. Let me, uh, let me, uh, Bert, should we, uh, you, you, Susan is standing on the other side of the, uh, Glass, wearing my jacket, freezing and shivering and shaking, and uh, and Bert is standing there. God knows what they're discussing. We're going to open the lines now, and uh, if you put on these earphones, I think you will be able to hear. All right. Well, actually, you can hear them on the uh, on the on the squawk box here. Uh, there are no calls. We have no calls. We need eight one eight nine eight five KPFK. Aha! There's the first line. And no one is there. That was wonderful. What a wonderful thing. We're talking 818-985-KPFK. Call in and speak to Mike Hodell's Hour 25 and speak to uh, Dick Lochte and, uh, and you can speak to me. I am uh, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley and I'm uh, delighted to speak to you. Ah, here's a line. Hello? Yes, hello. Yes, there you are. By God. Uh, we, we didn't hear any long line static. Uh, uh, who, are, who are we talking to? Well, this is Tom. Tom from where? Uh, Burbank. Tom from Burbank. What would you like to say to Dick Lochte? Well, perhaps uh, Mr. Lochte could uh, tell us about some uh, some other wonderful uh, contemporary mystery writers uh, whom he admires, enjoys reading. Who's hot these days? Oh, uh, you know, Elmore Leonard is the is the hottest Dutch, guy around. Dutch yeah. finally made it. And after it's nice, you know, it's nice yeah. that a guy, that can, you can make it after... Yeah, after, after only late. 40 years of writing <laughs> right, your brains right. out, right. Have you read the Harold Adams books? No. Oh, they're wonderful. I... Uh, the only way you're going to read the first three is if you come to my house because I got they were done by charter in paperback. They're, they take place in 1929 in Cordon, North Dakota, and uh, uh, the uh, the hero is a guy who's been in jail and now operates this seedy little rundown hotel for his mother and father. Mm-hmm. And uh, the stories are absolutely brilliant. They've done two of them. Now Mysterious Press has done two in hardcover, mm-hmm. and the three that were done 
by charter, which you cannot get. Hmm. But they are knockouts. I mean, they're the top of the pile. I, 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 I totally missed it. Take off an afternoon. Come by the house. We'll put you in an easy chair. We'll okay. give you the, the you know good asante. We'll give you chili, and you can read just to your heart's delight. Sounds like a wonderful idea. Who else? Who else are you reading? Jonathan Vallon. Vallon's very good. Val, I, I know Jonathan, and he's he's got a new one coming out uh, about pro football, which should be kind of interesting. What the, what's what's the, what's it called? Uh, I can't remember the name of it. The last one was Dragonfly Dragonfly Gad Quadroon. Gad Quadroon. No, no. What's the last one? The last one, uh, oh, I, unna unnatural, unnatural causes. I think was the name of his last book. I may have missed one. That was the one about uh, the. Uh, it, it was something about uh, serials, the, the the television soap operas. I missed that one. I must have got it. It's amazing that I missed a Valen novel. It's good. It's very good. I got I got Susan reading. Uh, you may not know about these because they haven't been reprinted either. They came in through uh, through Doubleday through that mystery uh, imprint they, they, that they have. They print two thousand copies right. in the libraries. Mm -hmm. An English woman named Anthea Cohen, and and they're they're novels about a woman who is a registered nurse who murders people. Oh, really? <laughs> she kills people. Uh, one of them is called Angel of Mercy, uh -huh. Angel of Vengeance, and Angel of Death. And uh, they are knockouts. Wow. They're, they're really knockouts. Again, come to the house. So she's like a hit woman, uh, a nurse hit woman. Well, anybody who pisses her off. Anybody oh, gets she upset, she just <laughs> offs them. You know, one guy she sends, she, she has crushed under a water wheel. Uh -huh. uh, 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 oh, she does the most horrible things to people. And all through the book, you just read it with your mouth <laughs> hanging open, saying, you know, well, how is this woman getting away with this? And how can, she, how can we like her? But you do. I mean, you just sort of like her. And... Uh, there's some real wonderful, peculiar stuff being done in mysteries these days. There, there is. There's, there's a lot of, uh, and and everybody's doing private eyes now. Yeah. Have you noticed how many how many private eye people there? Oh, uh, the uh, Block is a really good writer too. Um, Larry or Robert? Lawrence, Larry, Larry yeah. Block. He's, and he turns out four books a year, and all of them are good. And he's <laughs> teaching writing. And he's teaching, yeah. In fact, Larry came, you know, name-dropping. I've known Larry, my God, I've known Larry 25 years. We, mm -hmm. we lived in Greenwich Village together. And uh, he came by the house uh, uh, and just after his new one came out. Have you read Sacred Gin? Miller? Oh, yeah, I loved it. Loved it, it. For, for those of you out there who don't know what we're talking there's a new book out by Larry Block called When the Sacred Gin Mill Closes. Great title, isn't it's it? It's a great title, and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book, though, and they're reprinting all the Tanner books and and, mm -hmm. and, and all the Skip Harrison books. Yeah. And uh, who's your secret? Who's your secret pleasure? Your secret, the one you should not be reading. It's like, do you read Judith Krantz in your spare time? All right, I'll tell you. My secret pleasures aren't any c contemporary writers. There, I love Leslie Charteris. Oh, I'll, that's I'll, not. That's, well, it is. You know. Come you, on, you, he's great. You, t you talk to any of these people today about. Another guy, Richard Prather, Richard S. Prather. He's got a new one coming out. <laughs> well, I know. I met him in New York you about uh, about uh, a month ago, and the guy is great. I mean, he's... He, Do you know what happened to him? I, I heard that what happened is he wound up with a bad book contract, and, and he had to wait 10 years or so. That ain't quite what happened. Well... It's, uh, I'll tell you the inside okay. story, because he, when, he, when Richard Prather was doing the Shell Scott books yeah. in the 50s and 60s, he was the hottest writer in the country. Absolutely. He, the, the books flew off the stands. He was, before Donald Hamilton, before mm -hmm. any of these guys, Dick Prather's books really made it. And then he got this contract with, uh, he was with Gold Medal doing the originals, then he got so hot that he was, uh, they bought the, con Pocket Books bought his contract Pocket book, yeah. through Scott Meredith, and his first book was a hardcover for them in the Trident Press line, mm. and then all of a sudden he decided that he was a great social commentator, and that he had to write important stories about important things, and the mystery stories became tracts for oh, his political beliefs, and they were literally unpublishable. And the and pocket books took a look at these things and said, "Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, we're, we're buying Shell Scott. I mean, they're kind of light and easy reading, and you know, they if they comment on the passing scene, they do in the way that John McDonald does. Yeah. Uh, but what is this crap, you know? And and he was saying, you publish it the way it is, every word un, untouched or forget it. And they wouldn't publish the books. They That's would not. But he was the hottest writer in the country. They wouldn't publish the books because they were that bad. That's interesting. His his, his take on it, of course, is that." Uh they didn't know how to how to uh, release the books the way the gold medal did. <laughs> oh, 
Well, that's probably true. Gold medal, really. I mean, they they made them sleazy, uh-huh. and they were one of those wonderful Mitchell Hooks covers. Oh, those covers were great. Dynamite. They call them good girl art. And he, and, and as uh, Prather says, he said, you know, page 90 on every book, we had to have the RG scene. <laughs> right, exactly. And every time, he had, an, in, he had an, uh, an absolutely cornucopial mind for finding ways of doing new orgies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they'd always be, and it was always Hollywood stuff, too, yeah. you know. It was the kind of stuff you always thought really went on in Hollywood but until you got here. Have you ever, tell me something, I mean, come on, reveal the truth now. I've been here since 62. Mm-hmm. The closest I ever came to an orgy was one night, a guy whose name everybody would know, invited me to come to his house, and I came to his house with a date, and we walked in, and the living room was a sunken living room when you came out on a, you entered through on a balcony, and there was a stairway going mm-hmm. up, and we, and he had lined the entire floor with water beds from, from, from one side to the other, it was what, I was going to tell you what era it was, water beds, and there were all these people doing stuff on the, and I mean, there must have been 65, 70 people down there, and I stared in absolute, utter astonishment at this thousand dorked worm that was that was you know I mean it was nothing but asses as far as you could see and and it was I mean God knows I'm not a prude and I'm not taking one of those positions it was just so funny man I couldn't have gotten it up if my life had depended <laughs> on it and I looked at my date and she looked at me and she said are you kidding I said well, let's go home and we went, have you ever been at a party that even remotely approached anything that you hear about what Hollywood is supposed to be. No, no. The, o- the closest I've come to that was uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I was sent there by the late unlamented gallery magazine to do a feature on uh, the Mitchell brothers who were doing a, a, a cataclysmic ending to one of their films. And it was to take place in a place called the New American Music Hall. And it was just 35 couples in various states and, and uh, of various mixtures just going at it. And everybody was there. They had a press call, uh, Newsweek and Time. You know, they had all the representatives there. <laughs> and n- everybody knew that no one was going to cover this, <laughs> but they all came out for it. The, the ABC News was there, you know, shooting the film. And they're going to really show this on the, you know, the Eyewitness News tonight or something? No, nobody was going to do that, but everybody showed up. And it just went on and on and on for four hours until finally you just get so tired it just becomes nothing to you and the guy that I was there with the the photographer he puts his camera away and he says I think I'm tomorrow I'm gonna go in 25 hi Harlan Uh, it's Davey listen I I was very interested it's Davey wait Davey who you mean Davey who you said Davey yeah that's my name I, I, I understand that, but, but uh, do I know you? No. Oh, oh. It sounded, oh, it sounded it, like it sounded like well, we knew you, yeah. man. <laughs> oh, it's 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 you. You ask people their first name. Oh, right. Where, where are you from? I was. Pardon me. Where are you from? Hollywood. Okay. I was, are you at an orgy? <laughs> no. I was very interested in you talking about Borges, and uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the political connotations of his career. I I never got um, uh, the, the, pol- the political aspects of the man. I, I knew he was a, a librarian, but his, his uh, being a political activist, I never... Well, no, it's, it was not so much that he was a political activist. In fact, his, his politics were probably more mainline than anything else. I met Borges once. I met him at UC, He came to speak at UCLA a number of years ago. And uh, uh, some, he was brought in by the uh, by the Latin American Club or whatever. And, and and one of the people who was a member knew that I was mad for Borges and said, "Would you like to to go to hear him speak?" And I and I I went. I was just an awesome. Hmm. He was awesome. Uh, he was then almost totally blind, and he was being uh, uh, assisted by. Uh, it, it was probably Gregory Rabassa, who was doing the translating for him, and in the midst of. Borges is speaking, and he was speaking about art. Up leapt a uh, a young Turk, uh, a young Latino student, and he began to denounce Borges uh, for not uh, being uh, on the battlements and not writing propaganda fiction, 
and not writing uh, the kind of things that uh, that would fire people up to 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 march against injustice. And Borges, who was a very gentle man and 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 incredibly learned. I mean, he had a uh, I mean, he was fluent in six languages and and just knew everything. And uh, he grew angry. Uh, and, and, and this frail little man getting angry was an awesome thing to behold. There he stood, almost totally blind, in a in a in a in a quiet dark suit, and 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 he and he said to this uh, impertinent twit of a kid, um, uh, "I write fiction that will last forever. Propaganda lasts only as long as the cause is remembered." And he talked about Picasso's Guernica, that you need know nothing about the Spanish Civil War to be awestruck by that particular piece of art. And uh, this kid uh, denounced him in, 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 in Spanish and in English, and uh, half the audience, of course, were, 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 were trendy uh, uh, college kids who, who wanted to be uh, at the cutting edge of revolution or some goddamn thing in the middle of Los Angeles, you know, and, I mean, instead of being in Argentina where they were needed. And uh, 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 he, was, he was not politically correct because he was not... Um, uh, he was not involved in politics. That's that's what I meant to say. He he did not have this big political uh, uh, thing going on. He stayed out of it. He tended to his last. He was an artist. Who so did Hesse. Yeah. Well, this Latino kid probably would have beat the hell out of Hesse too. I mean, no, no. But what <laughs> my, I'm suggesting that from from what you're saying is that that the Nobel Prize in Literature is in some way. Uh, based on a person's politics, uh, that means that they have to be uh, politically active. Is what you're saying? Well, th 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 I'm th saying that that Hesse was not, and he got it. No, that w what I, that is not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that many things contribute to which writers will get it, and it always seems very capricious because they're forever giving it to people you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in their own country, some of these people are never heard of, and even after they win it, you still can't find their books. And when you do find their books, like Patrick White is the case that I kept, kept, kept remembering, I had never heard of Patrick White, and I know a great many Australian writers, and I thought, well, that's, you know, I knew, I knew he existed, but I'd never read him. When and did he win that? Oh, it was about five years ago, six, five or six years sure. ago. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I went and started reading Patrick White, and he was very tough to get through, and I did not find him particularly enriching. Uh, and here was Borges, who is not only accessible but revolutionized fiction. I mean, uh, there's virtually nothing owed to the English uh, to the European tradition in his work. I mean, it's this 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 magic realism that he that he pioneered for you know for for fifty years. Uh, they they were determined not to give it to him. I mean, I was as much as told that. On a, on a political... Uh, yeah, I, the, the fellow that said that to you, um, he really knew uh, what... You know, I mean, he, he had some sort of inside track. Yes, he's, track. yes he's, a, he's a very, very well-known New York writer. He's a, he's, a, he's a prominent writer. You'd recognize his name. And, he, and, and the thing about it is that you don't know the people... He's a, he's a big mover and shaker in PEN, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Mailers do. you know, uh, and, and they're always putting together these conferences and you, you go to the PEN conferences and everybody is standing around and talking revolution. Uh, they all want to, you know, be, 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 be solid with the African writers. Um, and I suppose in some ways that there's always a message in what you write at the burning core, but, uh, political writing uh, lasts only as long as that subject is of, of any interest. You look at the even the writing of Mailer uh, about Vietnam, and you find that it, it, it dates very quickly. Uh, Listen, we're going to move along. Thanks much. Yeah, say something to Dick Lochte, would you? Yeah, I am planning to write, or trying to write, a mystery novel set in Los Angeles myself. I know that voice, Dick. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, maybe Lochte does too. We were on a panel together once. Anyway... Did you do specific research when you were writing the Los Angeles scenes for your book, or did you just sit down and recall things? Uh, no research on the Los Angeles stuff. Uh, a good deal of research on, on the various uh, things that were involved with the book, the, the dog fights, for example. And, uh, How did you research that, for example? I, I don't want to get too, too much into it. A, a lot of it is available in... Um, uh, newspaper accounts and uh, Harry Cruz has uh, written extensively on the subject. I have a sneaking hunch. The reason you want to talk about it is because you had sources. 
Yeah, I, that, I, don't, I didn't mean to be prying on that particular subject. Yeah, and, and, if you just, talk about, and if you talk about those sources, Bill, you can get yourself killed real fast. These yeah. are mean people. Yeah, I know of the area. Bill, take care. All right, see you later. Bye-bye. 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 That was the, that was the dreaded Bill Warren, <laughs> a very nice man. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hour 25. I want to thank you for bringing up Borges. I, I hadn't heard about it. I think the thing that I find most amazing, uh, most interesting is writing is his, the way he brings in stuff from uh, so many cultures, uh, his references to Zohar and Judaism and to Islam, as well as to uh, Hispanic and Anglo sources. I think it's what, you know makes so much of his work very rich. And also, I think you can find a very similar pattern to um, the fact that he was criticized for his lack of political point in his writing, or the, the fact it wasn't obvious enough, with the Russian writers of the turn of the century, uh, Turgenev was hounded for uh, fathers and sons for not being political enough, and uh, it was, you know, at that time in uh, Russia, uh, writing, unless it, you know, art wasn't important unless it had politics in it. Yeah, it's, that's, that's one of the that's one of the hardest things, I think, these days for a writer who, who, who has any feeling about writing for posterity is that everybody is clamoring after you to be politically correct and relevant in the way that they wish you to be. <laughs> and if you're not, you're, you're, you're out of vogue very, very quickly. And that can be the death of your career because you can't sell a book. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming oh, on in. I also have a question for you. Oh, good. I, uh, I was wondering, what the, I know that you, uh, initially you were worried about the uh, American version of Brazil. American edition. I want to know uh, what you thought of it when you saw it. Both of you, actually. Well, how about you, Dick? I, you I haven't seen Brazil. Oh, you haven't seen it yet. No. Ah, oh, you missed it. It's it's as it's it's hot. You it's, like to hear it too. Yeah, I, well, I, the the version that I saw is the version that everybody finally saw because Terry Gilliam won his fight, and it was it was the English version minus only eleven minutes, which Terry said to me he was pleased to have taken out that they didn't matter. He said it was a nice eleven minutes, and it would have you know been, but uh, uh, he was already being criticized by uh, a lot of critics, uh, particularly back east. Uh, once the L.A. film critics gave it the award as oh, best yeah. picture, then of course the New York critics had to say, "What's wrong with these uh, these cuckoos out in California? The fruits and nuts are at work again." Exactly. And, and it was shameful that it did not get the recognition it should have during the Oscars. Uh, but then that's every year's uh, you know pageant of, uh, of of foolishness. Thank you much. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off there on those last words. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that takes care of that person. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, 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 hi. This is Teddy Wilder calling from the central part of the central city in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I live at the King Edward Hotel. My name is Teddy Wilder. I write checks with Theodore Wilder for W-E-I-L-E-R. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome uh, welcome into the group mind. Uh, yeah, the group mind is all right. You know, but the trouble is uh, here, down here, I live at the King Edward Hotel has an interesting history. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt is uh, rumored to have uh, stayed uh, somewhere in the environs of this uh, establishment that has chandeliers and it's got Doric Greek columns and marble floors. But outside is like the Congo, you know. So are you, are you uh, as you talked to, are you standing up, <laughs> sitting down, or lying on your back in lying bed? Lying on my mattress. That's know. what I thought. I knew you had to be lying on your back. <laughs> and, and, and is there a water stain on the wall? No, I, my wall is decorated oh. with, with all sorts of, you know, uh, overflowings of my past empty vessels. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just, it's marvelous place. And uh, I may have to move to Fa Fa uh, Fairfax, which is all right, you know, by me. Of course, it's a safer neighborhood. There are some flea bags down in the middle of town that every time I pass them, I swear I really want to go there and spend a week there because I could write like a madman in a room. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a little the flea bags. I, I, I was on the cardboards. I was sleeping in cardboard boxes for a while. I was in Auschwitz for three days, a place called Gravy Joe's. Gravy Joe's? Where's Gravy Joe's? Where is oh, it? Gravy Joe's, the Manual Baptist Mission. Uh, it's got to be, I mean, uh, uh, the place is with it on uh, Fifth and uh, down by town around there. A little up from town going like west uh, on the right side of the street as you're driving east. Teddy, what do you, what, what, what do, you, what do, you do to keep ends together? Well, uh, what I do, I'm a, well, I'm, you know, I hate to wear screenplay writer, you know, because that, you know, like housewives write screenplays, all that shit. Anyway, um, I, what I do is I'm a writer, uh, a writer... Fledgling producer, actor. Of course, you have to do that in the right order because first you have to write the fucking screenplay. Do I hear New Jersey in your voice? You hear the Bronx. Do I hear the Bronx? Yeah, you hear the Bronx. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought Pelham I did Parkway. take Pelham Parkway. Of course, Pelham Parkway. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the Pelham Parkway. Frankie Miano was my best friend. You know, but, you know, I was a, Jew, uh, I was a nice little guy from PS 105. I uh, had the glasses and uh, studied slide rules. I went to Bronx Science. had a 95.8 average. I uh, went to medical school. Fucked up at the... Uh, sorry, I can't use that. It's all right. It's cool. You know, the FCC will get on their case. It's all right. Anyway... Uh, you know, so third year, they did me a Vietnam number on me. I was a, uh, one of the towns in New York Medical Committee to end the war in Vietnam. And um, then uh, I was uh, took a bribe from the dean of uh, the Albert Einstein uh, Medical uh, University of Idiocy and uh, went on with my Ph.D. in neurobiology, which I excelled in, which was terrific. And I enjoyed it. I was at the Institute of Neurobiology in, uh, <coughs> not Karolinska, the other joint in uh, Schweden, uh, Used to the Bosch, which is a very boring place. Looks like Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, you know this. This this is the best conversation I've had on this program in weeks. And Lochte and I are sitting here grinning at each other <laughs> and saying, "This I guy." I last week. I couldn't believe that shit. I went to the other guy because I want to get his book. You know, but like then uh, I want to talk about that too. But you know, like last week, I <laughs> doing with a thing with the crackers, with the chocolate, the, with the um, Zagnet bars. With the what? The Zagnet bars, you Z- mean? Zagnet bars. Oh, yeah. Believe Listen. it. I said, what's this? Zagnet bars. <laughs> man, is, is it? I believe, this is the first time I heard Hall and Ellison on a, t- on a radio. Because I used to listen to Bob Fast all the time. Bob WBI days and all this. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, way back in New York. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, uh, and then I had, it's the first time I heard Ellison on a radio. Says, Christ! <laughs> really losing. Shit. Losing. These guys are outrageous. Yeah, losing this his mind. This guy's the funniest Zeno I've heard since Zeno. I mean, like, Groucho Marx duck's ass wouldn't. You know, well, I mean, this is like incredible stuff. Stuff was coming out of your head that was like, you know, filling the empty spaces of my cerebral cortex. Well, I, but you see, I grew, I grew up on, uh, on uh, um, um, oh my God, why is his name falling out of my head? Uh, Gene... Uh, Ray- Gene Rayburn. Gene Rayburn. Not Gene Rayburn. Gene <laughs> Shepard. Uh, Gene Shepard. You know what you know. I grew up on Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard, right. When, yeah, I, was, when, I, was in, yeah, when yeah. I was in college, I, I, you know, he was the only thing that kept that. me sane in the middle of Ohio. Listen. Ohio. Uh, I, I got stuck in the Ohio Turnpike for a... Uh, <laughs> Teddy, <laughs> Teddy, Teddy, Teddy. I got I to gotta, I gotta call a halt here because... Okay, yeah, I'll catch you later, man. Uh, listen, this cat's... Uh, uh, what's the name of the uh, book he wrote? The book is called Sleeping Dog. You will love it. Sleeping Dog. Not oh, Leaping yeah, Dog. Like sleeping. Barf, barf. And sleeping. I'm telling you, that stuff... Uh, that looks like that race. <laughs> came from, uh, whatever. Uh, anyway, I got to go get Sleeping Take care. Dog, stay uh, off uh, the Robitussin. Robot because you go on Broadway, down the river, shit, they don't have it. Right. So Take I'll catch you both later. Af- and thank you for okay. uh, uh, the gentleman's name uh, there. Dick Lock. Goodbye. Bye. Bye bye. Man's got to stay off the Robitussin. You know, he reminds me. <laughs> that I used to have. I used. I used. I used to. I used to sleep in in flop houses in New York. I used to go to the Lions houses, mm-hmm. and there was one guy who had his own private room. He had a private room, cost him six bucks a week. And the only reason he had a private room was because he drank nothing but Robitussin. Robitussin? <laughs> and he would save the bottles, and he had 187 million bottles of Robitussin up against the wall. I said, all right. You know, this guy never got a cold. He could walk out in 72 below zero, Jack, you know, with steam coming off his head. It was wonderful. Um, okay, on to the next one. A little crazy. I love it. Yes, sir. You're on uh, Mike O'Dell's Hour 25. What's up? Hi, Harlan. This is Christine from Paramount. Uh, another note on Borges. I just picked up a review copy. I have a book called Borges the Poet. Uh, I've not read it yet, so I don't know how it is, but the first, oh, 90 some odd pages of it are the Morgan Lectures, uh, discussions with Borges on mm-hmm. Dickinson, on Hispanic literature, and on English and North American lit. So it looks like it should be a pretty interesting book. Who's the publisher? That's from the uh, University of Arkansas. And it's called Borges the Poet? Yes. Oh, thank you very much, Christine. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See, this is this is a wonderful program. Absolutely, I, you find out also. All of kinds of stuff come. I, I, you know, I wanted Zagnets. We got Zagnet bars. Mm-hmm. I didn't bring any in tonight. I meant to bring in a couple. I, I feel cheated. All week long, people have been talking to me. They said, "My God, they love the part where I crunched the bar on the air." They said people had orgasms. I mean, people were getting crazed. Well, listen, if they if it's that easy, <laughs> it's a Zagnet bar. will do it for you. I mean, that's what they say. Chocolate is a substitute for sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, hello there, you're probably the last call. What's up? Oh, Jesus. Well, this is Richard. Oh, Jesus. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute, my God. Is that we, who's on? We reach further than we thought. <laughs> Who is this? Last call, such responsibility. Who is Listen, uh, I was interested in the talk about mystery writers earlier on. By the way, this is Richard calling from Hollywood. Yes, sir. And I have developed a taste for Max Collins lately, but he's really hard to find. Right, uh, there are two two I guess relatively new reissues of things. Uh, what were they? Uh, Quarry and Quarry's List. All right, now I'm about to t- I'm about to do you an enormous favor. What's that? You go to the Ambassador Hotel, 
and you go into the newsstand there uh, in the Chachka shop, you know, where they sell the, uh, the, the, the T-shirts and the mugs and the stuff like that, right? Okay. And in on the back wall, they have got paperbacks that they must have picked up from some remainder shop or somewhere. And they have got Max Allen Collins mysteries. They got about four of them there that have been out of print for fourteen <laughs> years. What are they in paper? Or they're, they're, they're paper. They're paper. You know, they, they, it's 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 one of those places where they where they where they where they buy job lots of paperbacks where the covers haven't been ripped off, and they're on the wall. You know, you got Harry Sinclair Drago novels <laughs> and, uh, and 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 Rosamund Marshall uh, romances. And <laughs> here, and I looked and I said, Oh my God, there's Max's. Uh, uh, and also, Max, of course, writes Dick Tracy. You know about mm. that? No, I didn't know that. Well, sure, Max he's writes. Been doing his, that for a long time. For for the last ten years, he's been writing it. And in fact, Blackthorn, uh, which is one of the comic publishers, are doing all of the uh, the Max Allen Collins Dick Tracys uh, in sequence, and you can and you can buy all of those, so you can see comic strips as well as read his books. Well, that'll be nice. That would be real nice. And he's got and he's got a brand new one that just came out. He's got a brand new novel that just came out. You can go to the scene of the crime. Uh-huh. I'm sure that you know about the scene of the crime. Uh, no. Oh, you poor soul! You. Well, that's what I'm saying. I well, you see, little, you, uh, you, you, you benighted fool! You, you live in Hollywood. Come over every once in a while to the valley. You come right over the top, and you come down. Uh, uh, you come down Laurel Canyon. You take a left, and you go on Ventura Boulevard to uh, to Woodman. It's uh, well, the easiest way to describe it is it's right down the street from Dangerous, Dangerous Visions. Visions <laughs> right, it's across the street from Dangerous <laughs> Visions, and it's called the Scene of the Crime, and it is a mystery bookstore, and they have everything there. Huh. And you and you ask for Bob. Bob is a nice man. He works there, uh-huh. and their phone number is nine eight one Clue C L U E. In case you want to call, and they'll tell you what they got by Max Collins. And there you go. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, folks. Bye bye. All right. Listen, we got one call left. Don't anybody else call in because I'm going to start reading uh, Clark Ashton Smith as soon as I boot this guy out of here. But here's the one last guy on the line. Yes. Oh my God. Hello. Oh my God. You've only been waiting since the dawn of the the Bronze Age, right? Yeah, well, it's just that I've been reading it since I was eight, so it's kind of a shock. Don't give me any of that crap. Just get on with the question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, before I make a fool out of myself, well, any more than I already have, are you just a mystery reviewer, Mr. Uh, Locker? Well, no, I, I review almost anything, but lately I've been reviewing mainly mysteries. Well, then, uh, Mr. Locker, as a, as a reviewer and Mr. Ellison as a reader and a reviewer, I guess, um, what have you thought of, of the newer books by, like, Vonnegut and Irving compared to like their older stuff. I don't think Irving writes mysteries worth a damn. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know that he writes. These are not mysteries. Anything. I know. I was putting you on. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Vonnegut, Vonnegut. I loved Vonnegut for a long time, <laughs> and I, I don't hate the new Vonnegut's. It's just that they seem to be more of the old Vonnegut over and over and over again. I don't know. I. I I, I've lost my uh, enthusiasm for the guy. Oh dear! It's uh, damper on the show then. W- oh, say what? I have I put kind of a damper on the show then? No, oh, no, no, no. put a damper at all. Kurt, Kurt's uh, an old, old, old friend of mine. He did a story for me for uh, for uh, again Dangerous Visions, and uh, when I go to New York, I see him, and uh, he's a terrific guy. I, I, I'm much with Dick. Uh, that the stuff that 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 knocked our socks off, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, and and uh, particularly uh, 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 pl- Player Piano and Cat's Cradle. Cat's Cradle. S- uh, Cat's Cradle is just just a, just a killer. I mean, it's to die yeah. from. Yeah. But you read the new stuff, and uh, you know, Kurt, Kurt. When Kurt did the short story for me, he said that he was going to stop writing. That he had written everything he wanted to write. And he didn't have anything much to say. Well, they started offering him so much money, and he became. I mean, he became a, a staple of American literature, so he had to keep producing. And the books I think he's doing now are, as Dick says, more of the same, and they don't till any new fields. No. And I think when a writer stops finding ways to make himself dangerous, um, he's an icon, and, and, and that's, not what, that's not what muscular writing is all about. That's sad. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, these are hard things to say because, I mean, he's a friend and I like his work and, and Dick obviously does too. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about it. Which Irving are you talking about, Clifford or, uh, or John? John, the New Hampshire man. Yes. I'm not sure that Clifford didn't, well, you don't know. You don't know whether, it, no, it has to be John who's writing. Did you read book. Tom Mix and Pancho Villa? 
Uh, yeah, I read I read a good portion of that. Now, he, that's not a bad. book. That's a hell of a that's book. That's not a bad book. I I loved it. I, I, no. it's, this is a, this is a book by another uh, Irving, uh, Clifford Irving, who was the man who was involved in the Howard Hughes uh, biography scam, and he's quite a reputable and responsible novelist in his own right. And he did a book for St. Martin's called Tom Mix and Pancho Villa, which is based upon the conceit that in fact Tom Mix did ride mm. with Pancho Villa for a couple of years, and nobody knows anything about that period. And uh, he takes that that one little fact, and he proceeds to do a historical novel filled with all manner of strange and wonderful oh, yeah, things. Uh, I recommend it to you if you can if you can locate it. Listen, thank you much for coming on in tonight. Uh, I had to cut you off. Okay, Dick Lochte, thank you very much. Now you're going to sign that for me and I will do a do number. That. Sure. I'll, okay. I'll be glad to do that. And yeah. I am going to start reading Clark Ashton Smith's *City of the Singing Flame*. Uh, the ending of it. Uh, I uh, I'm on. Part six, and we've got uh, about uh, about a third of the way to go, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to read it now for them. Yeah, just uh, I I'll tell you, I always am told that you're sh you're supposed to sign on the title page, that's right there. Right here. Yeah, you, you have got to. It. That's what I'm told. All right. Um, it doesn't have a lot of room there. That's a very big town. Well, you, we'll, we'll I'll figure I'll figure it you out. Figure it out. Right. Okay. And 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 if you want to sit, sit. If you want to go, just pick up and go. No one will, you know. And we'll talk, and I'll call you tomorrow and thank you. I'm going on with my program now because dead air is death. Yes, and, absolutely. And Bert Handelman is, uh, Handelsman is sitting in there and saying, for Christ's sake, read already. Sure. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm go sorry I had to cancel dinner no, on you. Go ahead and read. I'm no, going to no, read. No, no. <laughs> the guy's got the book open. You Don't you hate it? Somebody's always talking to you when you want to read it. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. Just. I <laughs> This is not fair. He's making me laugh, and I can't. This is a serious story written in Rotomatod, and I cannot laugh. So stop. Hey, read it. Folks, you don't know what he's doing. He's we, sitting over there pretending to sign the book and, and nudging me. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm waiting to hear it. Okay. If you recall, in the last chapter, the narrator was carried into the flame by the moth-like creatures. This is part six, The Inner Sphere. There was no room for fear, no time for alarm in the dazed and chaotic turmoil of my sensations. I was stupefied by all that I had experienced, and moreover the drug-like spell of the flame was upon me, even though I could not hear its fatal singing. I believe that I struggled a little by some sort of mechanical muscular revulsion against the tentacular arms that were wound about me. But the Lepidoptera gave no heed. It was plain that they were conscious of nothing but the mounting fire and its seductive music. I remember, however, that there was no sensation of actual heat, such as might have been expected when we neared the soaring column. Instead, I felt the most ineffable thrilling in all my fibers, as if I were being permeated by waves of celestial energy and demiurgic ecstasy. And then we entered the flame. Like Angarth before me, I had taken it for granted that the fate of all those who flung themselves into the flame was an instant, though blissful, destruction. I expected to undergo a briefly flaring dissolution followed by the nothingness of utter annihilation. The thing which really happened was beyond the boldest reach of speculative thought, and to give even a meager idea of my sensations would beggar the resources of language. The flame enfolded us like a green curtain, blotting from view the great chamber, then it seemed to me that I was caught and carried to super-celestial heights in an upward-rushing cataract of quintessential force and deific rapture and an all-illuminating light. It seemed that I and my companions had achieved a godlike union with the flame, that every atom of our bodies had undergone a transcendental expansion and was winged with ethereal lightness. It was as if we no longer existed except as one divine, indivisible entity soaring beyond the trammels of matter, beyond the limits of time and space to attain undreamable shores. Unspeakable was the joy and infinite the freedom of that ascent in which we seemed to overpass the zenith of the highest star. And then, as if we had risen with the flame to its culmination, had reached its very apex, we emerged and came to a pause. My senses were faint with exultation, my eyes blind with the glory of the fire, and the world on which I now gazed was a vast arabesque of unfamiliar forms and bewildering hues from another spectrum than the one to which our eyes are habituated. 
It swirled before my dizzy eyes like a labyrinth of gigantic jewels with interweaving rays and tangled lusters, and only by slow degrees was I able to establish order and distinguish detail in the surging riot of my perceptions. All about me were endless avenues of superprismatic opal and jacinth, arches and pillars of ultraviolet gems of transcendent, transcendent sapphire, of unearthly ruby and amethyst, all suffused with a multi-tinted splendor. I appeared to be treading on jewels, and above me was a jeweled sky. Presently, with recovered equilibrium, with eyes adjusted to a new range of cognition, I began to perceive the actual features of the landscape. <sighs> with, with the two moth-like beings still beside me, I was standing on a million flowered grass, among trees of a paradisal vegetation with fruit foliage, blossoms, and trunks whose very forms were beyond the conception of tridimensional life. The grace of their drooping boughs, of their fretted fronds, was inexpressible in terms of earthly line and contour, and they seemed to be wrought of pure ethereal substance, half translucent to the Empyrean light, which accounted for the gem-like impression I had first received. I breathed a nectar-laden air, and the ground beneath me was ineffably soft and resilient, as if it were composed of some higher form of matter than ours. My physical sensations were those of the utmost buoyancy and well-being, with no trace of fatigue or nervousness, such as might have been looked for after the unparalleled and, and, and marvelous events in which I had played a part. I felt no sense of mental dislocation or confusion, and apart from my ability to recognize unknown colors and non-Euclidean forms, I began to experience a queer alteration and extension of, of, of tactility through which it seemed that I was able to touch remote objects. The radiant sky was filled with many-colored suns, like those that might shine on a world of some multiple solar system. But as I gazed, their glory became softer and dimmer, and the brilliant luster of the trees and grass was gradually subdued, as if by encroaching twilight. I was beyond surprise in the boundless marvel and mystery of it all, and nothing perhaps, would have seemed incredible. But if anything could have amazed me or defied belief, it was the human face, the face of my vanished friend, Giles Angarth, who now emerged from among the waning jewels of the forest, followed by that of another man whom I recognized from photographs as Felix Ebenley. They came out from beneath the gorgeous boughs and paused before me. Both were clad in lustrous fabrics, finer than oriental silk, and of no earthly cut or pattern. Their look was both joyous and meditative, and their faces had taken on a hint of the same translucency that characterized the ethereal fruits and blossoms. "'We have been looking for you,' said Angarth. "'It occurred to me that, after reading my journal, you might be tempted to try the same experiment, if only to make sure whether the account was truth or fiction.' This is Felix Ebenley, whom I believe you have never met. It surprised me when I found that I could hear his voice with perfect ease and clearness, and I wondered why the effect of the drug-soaked cotton should have died out so soon in my auditory nerves. Yet such details were trivial in the face of the astounding fact that I had found Angarth and Ebenley, that they, as well as I, had survived the unearthly rapture of the flame. Where... Where are we? I asked after acknowledging his introduction. I, I, I confess that I am totally at a loss to comprehend what has happened. We are now in what is called the inner dimension, explained Angarth. It is a higher sphere of space and energy and matter than the one into which we were precipitated from Crater Ridge, and the only entrance is through the singing flame in the city of Idmos. The inner dimension is born of the fiery fountain and sustained by it, and those who fling themselves into the flame are lifted thereby to this superior plane of vibration. For them the outer worlds no longer exist. The nature of the flame itself is not known, except that it is a fountain of pure energy springing from the central rock beneath Idmos and passing beyond mortal ken by virtue of its own ardency. He paused and seemed to be peering attentively at the winged entities who still lingered at my side. And then he continued, 
I haven't been here long enough to learn very much myself, but I have found out a few things, and Ebonly and I have established a sort of telepathic communication with the other beings who have passed through the flame. Many of them have no spoken language or organs of speech, and their very methods of thought are basically different from ours because of their divergent lines of sense development and the varying conditions of the worlds from which they come. But we are able to communicate a few images. Uh, the persons who came with you are trying to tell me something. You and they, it seems, are the last pilgrims who will enter Idmos and attain the inner dimension. War is being made on the flame and its guardians by the rulers of the outer lands because so many of their people have obeyed the lure of the singing fountain and vanished into the higher sphere. Even now their armies have closed in upon Idmos and are blasting the city's ramparts with the force bolts of their moving towers. I told him what I had seen, comprehending now much that had been obscure heretofore, and he listened gravely and then said, It has long been feared that such war would be made sooner or later. There are many legends in the outer lands concerning the flame and the fate of those who succumb to its attraction, but the truth is not known or is guessed only by a few. Many believe, as I did, that the end is destruction, and by some who suspect its existence, the inner dimension is hated as a thing that lures idle dreamers away from worldly reality. It is regarded as a lethal and pernicious chimera, as a mere poetic dream or a sort of opium paradise. Uh, there are a thousand things to tell you regarding the inner sphere and the laws and conditions of being to which we are now subject after the re revibration of all our component atoms in the flame. But at present there is no time to speak further since it is highly probable that we are all in grave danger, that the very existence of the inner dimension as well as our own is threatened by the inimical, inimical forces that are destroying Idmos. There are some who say that the flame is impregnable, that its pure essence will defy the blasting of all inferior beams, and its source remain impenetrable to the lightnings of the outer lords. But most are fearful of disaster and expect the failure of the fountain itself when Idmos is riven to the central rock. And because of this imminent peril, we must not tarry longer. There is a way which affords egress from the inner sphere to another and remoter cosmos in a second infinity, a cosmos unconceived by mundane astronomers or by the astronomers even of the world about Idmos. The majority of the pilgrims after a term of sojourn here, have gone on to the worlds of this other universe, and Evanly and I have waited only for your coming before following them. We must make haste and delay no more, or, or, or doom will overtake us. Even as he spoke, the two moth-like entities, seeming to resign me to the care of my human friends, arose on the jewel-tinted air and sailed in long, level flight above the paradisal perspectives whose remoter avenues were lost in glory. Angarth and Evanly had now stationed themselves beside me, and one took me by the left arm and the other by the right. Try to imagine that you are flying, said Angarth. In this sphere, levitation and flight are possible through willpower, and you will soon acquire the ability. We shall support and guide you, however, till you have grown accustomed to the new conditions and are independent of such help. I obeyed his injunction and formed a mental image of myself in the act of flying. I was, I was amazed by the clearness and verisimilitude of the thought picture, and still more by the fact that the picture was becoming an actuality with little sense of effort, but with exactly the same feeling that characterizes a levitational dream, the three of us were soaring from the jeweled ground, slanting easily and swiftly upward through the glowing air. I was no longer Philip Hastain, but a larger, stronger, and freer entity, differing as much from my former self as the personality developed beneath the influence of Hashish or Kava would differ. differ. The dominant feeling was one of immense joy and liberation, coupled with a sense of imperative haste, of the need to escape into other realms where the joy would endure eternal and unthreatened. My visual perceptions as we flew above the burning, lucent woods were marked by intense aesthetic pleasure. It was as far above the normal delight afforded by agreeable imagery as the forms and colors of this world were beyond the cognition of normal eyes. Every changing image was a source of veritable ecstasy, and the ecstasy mounted as the whole landscape began to brighten again and returned to the flashing, scintillating glory it had worn when I first beheld it. Section 7. The Destruction of Idmos We soared at a lofty elevation, looking down on numberless miles of labyrinth and forest, on long, luxurious meadows, on voluptuously folded hills, on palatial buildings and waters that were clear as the pristine lakes and rivers of Eden. 
It all seemed to quiver and pulsate like one living, effulgent, ethereal entity, and waves of radiant rapture passed from sun to sun in the splendor-crowded heaven. As we went on, I noticed again, after an interval, that partial dimming of the light, that somnolent, dreamy saddening of the colors, to be followed by another period of ecstatic brightening. The slow tidal rhythm of this process appeared to correspond to the rising and falling of the flame, as Angarth had described it in his journal, and I suspected immediately that there was some connection. No sooner had I formulated this thought than I became aware that Angarth was speaking, and yet I am not sure whether he spoke or whether his worded thought was perceptible to me through another sense than that of physical audition. At any rate, I was cognizant of his comment. You are right. The waning and waxing of the fountain and its music is perceived in the inner dimension as a clouding and lightning of all visual images. Our flight began to swiften, and I realized that my companions were employing all their psychic energies in an effort to redouble our speed. Others were flying beside and above and beneath us now in the fluctuant glory, pilgrims of hidden worlds and occult dimensions, proceeding as we ourselves toward that other cosmos of which the inner sphere was the antechamber. These beings were strange and outré beyond belief in their corporeal forms and attributes, and yet I took no thought of their strangeness, but felt towards them the same conviction of fraternity that I felt towards Angarth and Ebonly. As we still went on, it appeared to me that my two companions were telling me many things, communicating by what means I am not sure much that they had learned in their new existence. Certain of these data, however, are roughly conveyable or suggestible in language. I was told of the gradual process of initiation into the life of the new dimension, of the powers gained by the neophyte during his term of adaptation, of the various recondite aesthetic joys experienced through a mingling and multiplying of all the perceptions of the control acquired over natural forces. I learned also of the laws that would control our passage to the further cosmos. Likewise, I was told that no one could return to our present plane from the higher cosmos, even as no one could go backward through the flame into Idmos. Angarth and Ebonly had dwelt long enough in the inner dimension, they said, to be eligible for entrance to the worlds beyond, and they thought that I, too, could escape through their assistance, even though I had not yet developed the faculty of spatial equilibrium necessary to sustain those who dared the interspheric path and its dreadful subadjacent gulfs alone. I have no idea of the duration of our flight, since, like everything else, my sense of time was completely altered and transfigured. Relatively speaking, we may have gone on for hours, but it seemed to me that we had crossed an area of that supernal terrain for whose transit many years or even centuries might well have been required. Even before we came within sight of it, a clear pictorial image of our destination had arisen in my mind. On and on we soared, and at length the mountain range appeared on the far horizon, and I saw the paramount peak of ultraviolet with its dazzling crown of cumulus. Nearer still we came, till the strange volutes of cloud were almost above us, towering to the heavens and vanishing among the very colored suns. And we saw the gleaming forms of pilgrims who preceded us as they centered and entered the swirling folds. At this moment the sky and the landscape had flamed again to their culminating brilliance. They burned with a thousand hues and lusters. I saw the mounting of a wall of darkness, dreadful and instant, positive and palpable, that rose everywhere and toppled like some Atlantean wave upon the irised suns and the fiery-colored vistas of the inner dimension. We hung irresolute in the shadowed air, powerless and hopeless before the impending catastrophe, and saw that the darkness had surrounded the entire world and was rushing upon us from all sides. It ate the heavens, blotted out the outer suns, and the vast perspectives over which we had flown appeared to shrink and shrivel like a fire-blackened paper. We seemed to wait alone for one terrible instant in a center of dwindling light on which the cyclonic forces of night and destruction were impinging with torrential rapidity. The center shrank to a mere point, and then the darkness was upon us like an overwhelming maelstrom, like the falling and crashing of cyclopean walls. I seemed to go down with the wreck of shattered worlds in a roaring sea of vortical space and force to descend into some infrastellar pit, some ultimate limbo to which the shards of forgotten suns and systems are flung. And then after a measureless interval there came the sensation of violent impact, as if I had fallen among these shards at the bottom of the universal night. I struggled back to consciousness with slow, prodigious effort, as if I were crushed beneath some irremovable weight, beneath the lightless and inert debris of galaxies. It seemed to require the labors of a titan to lift my lids, and my body and limbs were heavy, as if they had been turned to some denser element than human flesh, or had been subjected to the gravitation of a grosser planet than the Earth. 
My mental processes were benumbed and painful, and above me the light of a livid heaven came down among overturned and jagged walls that no longer supported their colossal dome. Close beside me I saw a fuming pit from which a ragged rift extended through the floor like the chasm wrought by an earthquake. I could not recognize my surroundings for a time, but at last, with a toilsome groping of thought, I understood that I was lying in the ruined temple of Idmos, and that the pit, whose gray and acrid vapors rose beside me, was that from which the fountain of the singing flame had issued. It was a scene of stupendous havoc and devastation. The wrath that had been visited upon Idmos had left no wall or pylon of the temple standing. I stared at the blighted heavens from an architectural ruin in which the remains of On and Angkor would have been mere rubble heaps. With Herculean effort, I turned my head away from the smoking pit whose thin sluggish fumes curled upward in phantasmal coils where the green ardor of the flame had soared and sung. And not until then did I perceive my companions. Angarth, still insensible, was lying near at hand, and just behind him I saw the pale, contorted face of Ebonly, whose lower limbs and body were pinned down by the rough and broken pediment of a fallen pillar, striving as in some eternal nightmare to throw off the leaden, clinging weight of my inertia, and able to bestir myself only with the most painful slowness and laboriousness, I got to my feet and went over to Ebonly. Angarth, I saw at a glance, was uninjured and would presently regain consciousness, but Ebonly crushed by the monolithic mass of stone, was dying swiftly. And even with the help of a dozen men, I, I could not have released him from his imprisonment, nor could I have done anything to palliate his agony. He tried to smile with gallant and piteous courage as I stooped above him. It's no use. I'm going in a moment, he whispered. Goodbye, Hastane. And tell Angarth goodbye for me, too. His tortured lips relaxed, his eyelids drooped, and his head fell back on the temple pavement. With an unreal, dreamlike horror, almost without emotion, I saw that he was dead. The exhaustion that still beset me was too profound to permit of thought or feeling. It was like the first reaction that follows the awakening from a drug debauch. My nerves were like burnt-out wires, my muscles dead and unresponsive as clay. My brain was ashen and gutted as if a great fire had burned within it and gone out. Finally, Rousing himself a little with evident difficulty, Angarth peered at the body of our friend and seemed to realize in some measure the horror of the situation. But I think he would have remained there for hours, or perhaps for all time, in his utter despair and lassitude if I had not taken the initiative. Come, I said with an attempt at firmness, we, 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 we must get out of this. <laughs> Where to? he queried dully. The flame has failed at its source, and the inner dimension is no more. I wish I were dead, like Ebonly. I, I, I might as well be, judging from the way I feel. We, we must find our way back to Crater Ridge, I said. Surely we can do it if the interdimensional portals have not been destroyed. Angarth did not seem to hear me, but he followed obediently when I took him by the arm and began to seek an exit from the temple's heart among the roofless halls and overturn, overturned columns. My recollections of our return are dim and confused and full of the tediousness of some interminable delirium. I remember looking back at Ebonly lying white and still beneath the massive pillar that would serve as his eternal monument, and I recall the mountainous ruins of the city in which it seemed that we were the only living beings. It was a wilderness of chaotic stone, of fused obsidian-like blocks where streams of molten lava still ran in the mighty chasms or poured like torrents down unfathomable pits that had opened in the ground. And I remember seeing amid the wreckage the charred bodies of those dark colossi who were the people of Idmos and the warders of the flame. Like pygmies lost in some shattered fortalice of the giants, we stumbled onward, strangling in mephitic and metallic vapors, reeling with weariness, dizzy with the heat that emanated everywhere to surge upon us in buffeting waves. The way was blocked by overthrown buildings, by toppled towers and battlements over which we climbed precariously and toilsomely, and often we were compelled to divagate from our direct course by enormous rifts that seemed to cleave the foundations of the world. The moving towers of the wrathful outer lords had withdrawn. Their armies had disappeared on the plain beyond Idmos, when we staggered over the riven, shapeless, and scoriac crags that had formed the city's ramparts. Before us was nothing but desolation a fire-blackened and vapor-vaulted expanse in which no tree or blade of grass remained. 
Across this waste we found our way to the slope of violet grass above the plain which had lain beyond the path of the invaders' bolts. There, the guiding monoliths, reared by a people of whom we were never to learn even the name, still looked down upon the fuming desert and the mounded rack of Idmos. And there, at length, we came once more to the grayish-green columns that were the gateway between the worlds. Good night, Michael.